a Roman fort visible from the air, massive defense works, an ancient port lost to time. What would happen if the greatest and final victory of Caesar was in the wrong place? If Scholars' entire map of East Tunisia was a hundred miles too far south? But first of all, hi, I'm David Rudman, creator of AncientMiddleEast.com. I map the ancient world. My belief is that if ignorance of scripture is ignorance of Christ, then equally ignorance of the ancient world is ignorance of scripture. So if you think this kind of work is valuable, then please pull strings to get me into a research institution somewhere. Unlike other guesses on YouTube, which put the battle 100 miles south on the southern Tunisian coast, in this video you'll see where the Battle of Thapsus actually transpired. Why do they think that? All of them say that the Battle of Thapsus is in the middle of nowhere. They even seem to have a definite idea of where each of the relevant cities is. Well, obviously, because that's what the scholars say. But why do they say that? It just doesn't make sense. Why would an empire-determining battle be down here or in deep desert? Well, they say, the climate was greener then, but even so, why even in semi-desert? Why not in the rich, lush, green heartlands of Caesar's adversaries? We know where Scipio was based, Utica. We know where King Juba was from, the rich heartland of Numidia, mountain to metropolises like Semitu and Serta, his most opulent city. So why would Caesar choose to land here, in the land of small potatoes? What does this have to do with that? Maybe the official narrative has got something wrong. Let's do more research into where exactly this identification of Thapsus came from. Well, the reason they say it's there is the ancient world's tour guide, Strabo. Strabo had made mistakes before, living as he does far off in Asia Minor, and not always personally seeing the locations he describes. So anyway, Strabo is here charting the coast of Africa around 20 AD. He mentions Carthage, Tunis, Hermea, Neapolis, Aspis, Cosira, Malta, Adramedum with its naval arsenal, or you could instead argue that Adramedum is 70 miles south at the more commonly accepted location, but that's all immaterial. As regardless, next Strabo lists the Terichii Islands, and then Thapsus, and last Lopedusa. Hey look, said the scholars, that's where Thapsus is. Thapsus has to be east of the Terichii Islands, and the Terichii Islands can only be here. There are no other islands in that bay. So this must be Thapsus at modern Tabulba in green. But wait, does Tabulba sound like Thapsus? A little bit, but what happened to the double S? Let's look at the Putinger map, where we have both Thapsus and, uh, oh, Tapura side by side. Does Tabulba sound more like Tapura? or like Thapsus. So it's probably not Thapsus at all. That's probably ancient Tapura at modern Tabulba. But wait, Strabo wrote Thapsus. Oh, but that must just mean that Strabo was wrong. Or maybe a much later editor thought he knew better and wrongly changed it from what it was really supposed to be, namely Tapura, to the fateful misdesignation of Thapsus, and ancient North Africa's map has been screwed up ever since. Let me give you an idea of how screwed up this is. Here's the most important peninsula in all of North Africa. I'll call it the Clipeus Peninsula, Greek for shield, because Clipeus is the huge rock at the end of it, which everybody agrees on. It's definitely right there. This peninsula is the tactically decisive breadbasket, the bridge to Europe and the bridgehead into Africa, the controller of the Straits of Sicily. And yet, while they think they kind of gulp know most of the cities around the edge of it, yet in the center, they don't have a clue. See all these green place names? They're from the Islamic era, after 700 AD. As far as they know, 
The Romans didn't touch the interior of this peninsula. But that's impossible because see all these cross hatches everywhere? That's centuriation, archaeological evidence of the marking out of farmers' as fields by Roman surveyors. So there had to be Roman cities all through the interior of here. Why can't they think of any names? Gosh, they don't even have any guesses. Could it have to do with the confusion we just discovered about the false location of Thapsus? Well, let's look at the other end, down in the south. If Thapsus had been wrongly pushed 75 miles too far south, then all the other coastal cities, like train cars on a train, would be dragged southward too, and now would mismatch with their modern place names. So let's see if their ancient place designations say, sound anything like the modern ones. Not much. For comparison, here's my competing schema. The evolutions are much more plausible. Indeed, I claim to have found the locations of many cities even in the interior of that decisive Clopeus Peninsula, where they couldn't. Now, my success or failure will probably be most evident from the plausibility of the entire Thapsus campaign that I presented in the animated Battle of Thapsus reading video at the link in the video description below. But in order to best understand that, it is important to first stop and do some remedial review of the materials that we'll be working with. I've already mentioned the Barrington Atlas and Strabo. Then there's the Pudinger map. The lower half here is Africa. In fact, that part of Africa that we're dealing with. You can see Carthage, which everyone agrees on, and these two little bays here with Tunis in between them. Then Clopeus Rock at the end of that peninsula, which again, everyone agrees on, surrounded by two more curious little bays. Next, Hadrito, also known as Adramitum, and Thapsus. Then at the extreme south is Takapa, which again, everybody agrees on, where the coast turns east again towards Egypt, way down at the extreme southern limit of Little Sirtis Bay. Then there's Ptolemy. We'll focus on the area here in the Red Square. A trained eye could make out Carthage, Adramitum, and Thapsus, but don't worry if that's too hard to read. We'll have a solution to that in a second. I call this Ptolemy's Gray Edition. This is actually a medieval rendering of the original Ptolemaic list of cities. Here is the medieval Brown Edition, another medieval rendering. All these editions may differ slightly, e.g. they might plot a particular city on the opposite side of a river from a different edition, but for the most part, they're all identical. And then here's the color edition. Let's zoom out. Notice what's along the edge. Strange numbers. Perhaps we can figure out what those are if we look at the original Ptolemaic text. Find this Google book here, or click the link in the video description, and after using my table of contents, also in the video description, to navigate to the section about Africa, you'll see this. Let's see. The word there seems to match carpus, and there's clopea, carabas, seagull. He's obviously just going along the coast, okay? Adramidum, leptis micra, acola. Oh, look what we skipped over. Thapsis. And now, what are these columns over here? Oh, gulp. Those are ancient Greek numbers. You can find a link to this chart in the video description. There's the ones, the tens, the hundreds column. Here we have 37. What would this be? 32. So basically, what we've got here are values for longitude and latitude. Now, there are a few other weird symbols here, which I'll just have to tell you. The top one here, which looks kind of like the math symbol for a bisected angle, logically means one half. The bottom one means one third, because gamma is the third letter, as you know if you learned your Greek ABGs. Alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, zeta, eta, theta, iota, kappa, lambda, mu, nu, xi, omicron, p, rho, sigma, tau, upsilon, phi, ki, psi, omega. But I digress. And the prime mark makes it a fraction. So gamma prime means one-third. Then the middle weird one here, gamma omicron prime, means two-thirds. That added omicron probably makes it plural from the genitive plural ending. 
own. As in, not just a single third, but two of them. So these are fractions. Can you guess what fraction this would be? Correct. Greek delta is the fourth letter, so this is one fourth. Let's do a hard one. What fraction is this? If you said five six, then you were correct. And this? Three fourths. Here's the hardest one up here. I'll give you a clue. These two characters are a single number. Not ten then two, but just twelve. So this is. Yep, seven twelfths. Thapsus then is at the coordinates 37.5 east longitude, 32.5 north latitude. How did I know east and north? Well, I just know from experience that these numbers extend from zero in the supposed Isles of the Blessed out beyond the Atlantic Ocean all the way eastward to 180 degrees in China and from negative 20 degrees south in southern Africa all the way north to about 65 degrees north in northern Scotland. So basically these numbers vaguely approximate our modern degree latitudes and longitudes. Ptolemy's equator is where ours is, and his prime meridian isn't far from ours. Ptolemy definitely knew the size of the Earth. These coordinates are actually what best defines Ptolemy's geography, as his original Greek gives not maps at all, but just this list of latitudes and longitudes from which a map could be constructed, and as you saw in three examples, were constructed in the Middle Ages or earlier, though we don't have those additions anymore. So now that we know Thapsus' coordinates, we can use those formerly curious numbers to plot it. Should be right about here. But in fact, the medieval mappers drew it a little off to the side. Ptolemy's latitude and longitude lines should make a nice, perfect grid, a checkerboard. In reality, though, they get distorted like this. Here are the longitudes and the flatitude latitudes with strange latitude 28 having its own closed off eddy, although I forced it to burst, break through to that. I happen to know that these lines do this because I've plotted every single city and then drew the lines relative to the points on the map. Notice the Clopeus Peninsula here and how the coastline makes a nearly complete 270 degree rotation around it. At the first green bend, it starts heading south. So the entire red bar here should begin to have a changing north-south latitude, unlike all the prior coastline, which had a changing east-west longitude instead. But surprisingly, in the Ptolemaic list, that red bar of coast still shows changing longitude from 31 east to 38 east, not changing latitude, which remains fixed at 32 north. So Ptolemy clearly thinks that the entire coastline continues to go east, exactly as we see in the map here. Only at Usilla, or some say Vasilla, do these show it starting to head south. Small wonder, then, that the experts think that Usilla should be somewhere around this cape, where such a turn to the south occurs. My goodness, that's in fact the very thing that Ptolemy seems to show, doesn't he? But wait. We already know that Ptolemy had messed up the general direction of the coast, rotating its way around the Clopeus Peninsula by not rotating far enough through a full 270 degree orbit and instead doing a mere 180 as shown here. So now he's heading in the wrong direction. What if to correct this, Ptolemy had to transition back to a southern direction somewhere and so this second green bend is just a fluke and not to be taken seriously. And what if while Ptolemy was drafting his original scratch version on his scratch pad, he was instead awkwardly gnawingly aware that the coastline near Usilla actually does the reverse, a concavity rather than a convexness. How would he represent that? Why, while maintaining the macro 
from the convex correction towards the south in green, he would slip in a microconcavity in the immediate vicinity of Vasilla, which is exactly what we see here in the light blue arrow. That's why I, unconcerned with the coastline's direction, but just following my own system, may actually be more correct when I place Usilla at a concave turn than they are when they place it at a convex one, because I alone take into account both curves, the light blue and the green, whereas they only in take into account the green one. So whoever first plotted Usilla way down south was probably just trying to match the biggest, most obvious coastal curve which they saw there. They saw a giant curve Exynos on the map, and they said, aha, Usilla must be there. But they themselves admit that the map is already wrong in circumnavigating Clapeus, which we all agree upon. So why would we use the map's erroneous vector or direction to locate a linchpin keystone city like Usilla that's going to de de determine all the other cities surrounding it? We wouldn't, because nothing ever follows from a negative. If shapes are wrong, then they shouldn't be prioritized which is what I suspect happened here. That's why I have instead followed mainly Pudinger distances, supplemented by the whole Ptolemaic constellation of points in a comprehensive totalistic manner to find all cities, not just Usilla. In fact, I've mapped every ancient Roman place name on the entire continent of Africa, not plopping down lone trees here and there, but expanding the entire network of the entire forest from one end to the other on a continually bleeding edge by carefully triangulating every new city in relation to the surrounding ones surrounding it. Since we all agree on Clapeus and Tecapa at either end, but only disagree about the red cities in between, the main question here is then, how smushed northward are those red cities? When you see my data points, I always first list the Ptolemaic longitude east and then the Ptolemaic flatitude latitude afterwards. Thus, each datum is easily checked relative to the, to the cluster of points surrounding it. It's not perfect, but like a loose elastic spider's web, it guides hunting and gives me some estimation of how self-corroborative a particular province may be based upon how many cities I am finding in their correct locations relative to one another. When one approaches mapping in this way, not skipping any city, but trying to account for every single point in a paragraph, one becomes subtly aware of super macro Ptolemaic trends, such as that a paragraph of cities will all fit together coordinates wise with cohesive integrity and self-corroboration, but different paragraphs won't necessarily fit together with one another. For instance, the coordinate system for inland cities doesn't match up seamlessly with that for coastal cities, which is, as it were, on a totally different grid system. And scattered in amongst both, there are sections seemingly appended by a later editor, perhaps one or two centuries later, that don't match the coordinates of the original cities, yet display clearly similar, sometimes identical names. All these I mark in orange as Ptolemaic revisions. Thus, for instance, of Caesar's Uzita, there's also Uzetia, Uzikia, Uzica, and Utikna, all with nearly identical coordinates. And let's not forget Pudinger's road sequences, which slice through the web like a knife through butter or like girders to which the web can be nailed down at various points, corroborating and confirming both each other's accuracy. Now that we know how the primary sources work and work together, now we can move on to the specific contextual evidence about this particular battle of Thapsus and why it's definitely in northern Tunisia, not a hundred miles south of there. From Ptolemy and Pudinger, we'll bring in arguments one and two here. 
from Caesar's own accounts will bring in arguments three and four. And lastly, from Google Earth, we'll import arguments five and six. Argument one, coastal place name evolutions. Here you can see that by putting all the cities in the north, I have enabled derivations from ancient to modern place names that are plausible in green in six and a half out of seven cases. Out of these, the strongest is always yellow. Here, ancient Suluk being pronounced as modern Tazerka. S becomes TS, and the liquid L becomes the liquid R. So Suluk becomes Tzirk becomes Tazerka. I always list such proposed place name evolutions for every site in their respective pins. See the Thapsus KMZ file below or any other KMZ that I publish at ancientmiddleeast.com. Now let's compare their official place names, which are obviously worse. However, some of them are pretty good. For instance, they locate that Suluk at Salakta, which does sound nearly identical. However, in this case, we have to consider another possibility that perhaps these southern cities were perhaps wrongly renamed what the invading Greeks thought ancient Suluk had been when in 533 they began their Byzantine invasion there under General Belisarius of a province that the Byzantines had never owned and which hadn't seen any Romans of any sort in a hundred years. Under such circumstances, the Greeks would certainly have been using maps such as, you guessed it, coastal distorting Ptolemy and Pudinger. So some of these plausible sounding names may be a result of Byzantines being fooled exactly as moderns are. The contrast is even more stark in inland cities, where all of my cities sound like the ancient place names, and almost none of theirs. They're literally floundering through the nondescript desert, placing question marks after nearly everything. It's hard to even characterize these as educated guesses. I, on the other hand, for a city like Tegea, claim to have found the Roman camp which Scipio built there. And the more you get into Caesar's narrative, the more you'll find that southern Tunisia's land is just too bland to support the sophisticated level of tactical maneuvering which Caesar describes. Which brings us to our next kind of evidence, hills. Caesar frequently speaks about hills being decisive in the Thapsus campaign's battles, enabling enemy cavalry to sneak up, hidden from sight, and enabling the construction of hilltop redoubts. But there are no hills. Nothing but the greatest flatness around Rispino, making Caesar's description of the cavalry's sneak raids on the ships as water carriers in chapter 7 utterly impracticable, as well as this battle below at Rispino, where he established his camp three miles from Rispino, on the red circle here, and then he was informed by his scouts that the enemy was in, in view, so soon after, i.e. pretty close, he ran into the enemy army and the enemy's horse began to extend themselves and move in a lateral direction so as to, quote, encompass the hills. Here we see where they claim this episode occurred. Notice the three-mile radius in red and the brown edges of hills barely visible on Google Earth, when even when elevation has been triply exaggerated to three times its natural height, as is shown here. Notice how flat the terrain is. This is not a place where hills would be tactically decisive. A little nearby here is the actual border of one of those hills, and it's barely noticeable from either direction. But here's where I place the battle. Are there hills there? Definitely. Do we see a, quote, mountain, close quotes, anywhere near here? But we certainly have one where I place the battle next to Caesar. Is it reasonable for Caesar coming from Sicily with the most formidable army ever seen to come all the way south so that he can go back north again? Or alternatively, to come all the way south so as to, quote, seek the interior in the vicinity of the future Fossatum Africum, the furthest border to keep out the desert tribes? Ah, but it would be reasonable to seek the interior of rich, lush Numidia 
and Scipio's capital, Utica, wouldn't it? Is it reasonable that Caesar being in a boat would mention the enemy's cavalry as appearing on the beach, quote, toward Clopeus? If Clopeus were behind him across 70 miles of water? Ah, but it would be reasonable if Clopeus were 12 miles to the right, continuously along the beach. Is it reasonable for Caesar, all within one single day, to ride 11 miles by horse, oversee a surrender at Adramedium, and then sail 150 miles by sea in such a way that he would have to sail much of it against the wind? Ah, but it would be reasonable, wouldn't it, to travel just five miles by horse and 68 miles by sea all in one wind direction. Is it reasonable for troops coming from Sicily to get blown off course 107 miles where they get captured by the enemy's navy just waiting there? Or would a mere 20 miles off course be more reasonable? And if you think that's bad, is it reasonable for Caesar's ships to miss their target by 36 degrees for a whopping 152 miles? Ah, but it would be reasonable, wouldn't it, for them to miss their target by a mere 22 degrees for 81 miles. Lastly, is it reasonable for 60 ships to have to defend 115 miles of coast complete with intervening deep water, even though Caesar said only to go a little way into the deep water? Or would it be more reasonable and green for those 60 ships to have to defend a mere 26 miles of coast with no intervening deep water? Now, of course, just because the official version doesn't add up doesn't necessarily mean that mine does, because we could both be wrong. Thus, the only sure way to be ultimately convinced of my geolocation of the Thapsus campaign, where I do, is to actually watch it at the first link below in the video. For there are probably a hundred sites mentioned in connection with that campaign, and only by watching the video will you be able to decide for yourself whether each and every site is at a plausibly realistic location. However, I'd like to take from this video and present here just eight of those sites as sample pieces of evidence of the plausibility of my location of Thapsus. First, Caesar writes of building a triple fort 1,500 meters from the walls of Thapsus. I believe that we can still see this in Google Earth here. If you're worried about context, don't worry. You'll be able to see the rest of Thapsus in a moment. Second, Caesar writes of building giant, quote, lines of communication, close quotes, across the hilltops, approaching towards the two corners of Uzita so that he could safely bring up his catapults to bombard the city immune from side attacks. I think we can see these here. Third through eighth, I'd like to present the outlines of six separate Roman military camps in connection with this campaign. Third, we can see Scipio's beautiful camp above Tegea. Two more smaller camps may be on the, quote, dragon teeth hills, just off the screen below it. Fourth, we can see Caesar's temporary hill camp near Agar, which isn't built up much because he didn't stay there very long. Fifth and sixth, we can see Scipio and his Numidian ally King Juba's camps side by side with each ally's camp in the photo's top left corner. Seventh, we can see Scipio's half-built camp right next to Thapsus, the attempt to build which, right in Caesar's backyard, made his army an extremely vulnerable sitting duck to be finally caught off guard by Caesar's campaign-weary army. Eighth, here we see Caesar's siege lines around Thapsus. In the lower left-hand corner there, you can also see Caesar's triple fort, which I spoke of a few seconds ago. Of course, on the right side of the city, I'm not really sure exactly where the siege lines are. They could follow a different field line. Therefore, these eight sites are part and parcel of the greater evidence of the entire campaign, which I invite you to watch at the first video in the video description. The fact that this video's sequence of events 
is even plausible to me in his locations on Google Earth is astounding and utterly delightful to me. Make of it whatever you will. But if Thapsus and this whole campaign is where we say it is, there's still one awkward gnawing mystery, which flies in the face of concluding that Adramedum really is the mountain top and modern city of Adra. It has no port. Yet an integral part of Caesar's narrative is an illusory port of Adramedum. Caesar even gives it a special name, calling it a Kothon, Greek for drinking cup. If you recall, my Adramedum is a tactically powerful mountaintop lookout at the end of the Clopeus Peninsula from which two of the peninsula's three seas can be scanned and monitored for approaching ships, the third sea being monitorable from the nearby point of Clopeus, easily visible within smoke signal distance in the background here. So where is Adramedum's port? Caesar writes in two places that his enemy's naval commander Varus quote, left Adramedum out of the Kothan and then later rushed into Adramedum into the Kothan. The word Kothan is most commonly used for the circular port of Carthage, Kothan being Greek for a drinking cup, thus explaining the port's iconic circular shape. Thus, nearly everyone assumes that Varus rushed out of and back into Carthage 60 miles away. But surely, Carthage cannot be called the port of Adramedum. Against this, the word Kothan for a harbor actually occurs in many places throughout the ancient world, so identification with Carthage is by no means necessary. That's why the official mappers place the Kothan, and with it Adramedum, way down south at Susa, where there is admittedly a kind of port like that, but we've spent this entire video arguing that these southern locations can't be correct. So, assuming that the Kothan is indeed somewhere near my Adramedum, where is it? No natural port is visible anywhere along this coast that would be deep enough to accept seagoing Quinquireme transport ships. Worse, what we might expect to be the harbor, namely the port at Ruspina, a mere four miles away, isn't, as Caesar's account indisputably proves, which means that the Kothan of our Adramedum, whatever it is, must be either closer or significantly more imposing than this port of Ruspina. Well, let's check again the other sources. Here's Ptolemy's map. No sign of any harbor here. Here's the Putinger map. Hey, look at that. Notice how in between Clopeus and Adramedum, there's this curious inlet, number four. That's strange. We saw nothing like that a second ago flying along the coast. Right next to it is a, quote, Horea, Latin for granary, almost as if major grain shipments were going out of here. Well, that Horea is probably modern Hawaria, or rather eastern Hawaria. But there's no sign of any inlet there in the foothold hills between Horea and Clopeus. So what's going on? Let's check a modern survey. Do you notice anything? Smudged out bottomland. Here. Even more interesting, see all these crosshatches? We said that that's where centuriation was, or Roman surveying of square fields. But it's not there in that bottom land, which must mean that in Roman times, this wasn't a field. Oh my, so that might be a harbor, but let's keep looking. Notice the distance from Orbita to Horea? 22 miles! The entire coast is only 15 miles. So how can that be? Now, the Putinger map often leaves Roman numerals off, but rarely does it put too many on. So the best that we might assume is that this could be a miswritten XVII, or 17, the X being a miswritten V. But that's still way too far, because Orbita 
probably is this pre-Roman orbital-looking Phoenician city, which leaves us only seven miles of coastline left before we run smack dab into the point of Clopeus, much less into an even closer city of Horea. But what if there was an inlet there? And what if Horea wasn't on the near side of the inlet, but on the far side, as the positioning of modern Hawaria north of that bottom land seems to suggest? Oh, now 17 miles does start to make sense. And what about this seven miles to Kuban? Yeah, that could work too. But one huge problem. It's at 60 meters elevation. There's no way this whole thing silted up with 60 meters of silt. So this is, at best, a lake, connected perhaps by marshland to the sea, but definitely not a harbor. It still might explain the 22 miles f from orbit to Terea, but it's not the Kothon. So let's keep looking. The best other good place for the Kothon is either four miles from Adramentum here, next to Orbita, or six miles from it here at the Lake of Flamingos. This second one is approximately the same size as the Kothon of Carthage, but this is a job for archaeology, to find the anchors of the ships which Caesar burned outside the harbor, not for cartography. So sorry for the anticlimactic ending, but yeah, we haven't positively identified the Kothon yet. Conclusions. In conclusion, we've argued from over a half dozen different kinds of evidence that the Battle of Thapsus couldn't have been held anywhere except in extreme northeast Tunisia, surrounded perhaps by an ancient harbor and numerous military camp footprints as well as other battlements. If this is all true, then it means that not only does this battle need to be a hundred miles further north, but all of the surrounding cities on the map also need to be plotted a hundred miles further north of where they currently are, or really 75 miles as the crow flies. Tunisian history and archaeology may both need to be rewritten. Museums may need to be renamed. Digs must be refocused on new target areas. Last of all, if this method of finding cities has succeeded, then the door is wide open for the same technique as mine of combining Ptolemy and Pudinger with etymological place name analysis to be used in preference to and instead of whatever method is currently being used by the Barrington Atlas of the ancient world. Hundreds or even thousands of more cities might be found all throughout Europe, I myself having concentrated at my own site, ancientmiddleeast.com, just on the barbaric regions. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and a share to your favorite discussion group, as I'm a truly small-scale videographer focusing 90% of my time on actual research, only 10% on publication. So I have no following on YouTube. Additionally, I will soon run out of the ability to do work like this, so if you like to see this kind of work continued, then please pull strings to get me into a research institution somewhere. Many such institutions positively desire scholarly publication ability, and that's something that I definitely have, despite having no advanced degrees, but only a double, basically triple bachelor's. Alternatively, if you would be willing to give recommendations for me to apply for grants from the National Endowment for the Humanities and similar institutions, please contact me at my email address in the video description. Thanks for watching, and don't forget about the other two short and long Thapsis animation videos. My channel also does lots of other classics, philosophy, and theology videos on a wide variety of other topics, which you can all find here. Goodbye.